In a shocking 1700s historical document to black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes, also known as black Jews, were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option one. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option two, get an easy to read edited ebook plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of ten dollars. Option three, get an audiobook for easy listening plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of fifteen dollars. Learn the real history they don't want you to know. Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, after the feast, uh, a little bit about the former and the uh, latter reigns. To be a little bit more information than that, but uh, we're going we're going to get into this. And I, I just want to see if you see the symbolism because it's important understanding doctrine. Uh, how you know how we how we come up with our doctrine? We have to know these these type of things, the former and the latter reign. So before we do that, uh, let's look at our Hebrew nugget. Uh, the title is long, uh, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's, it's the West African uh, Countries and Peoples by James Africanus Bill Houston, 1868. Um, I put a link in here. I hadn't found a good download yet for the whole document, but I will. Uh, but um, uh, I put a link in here to Google Books, and you can you can read it there. So in this particular text. Um, I won't read the whole thing, just little excerpts. In the first couple of sentences, it says, in those early days, Africa was known and famous amongst uh, the uncivilized portion of the world. And the Assyrians and Babylonians were among its earlier, earliest conquerors. So that about 67 years after the destruction of the temple, we are told in Esther that uh, Ahasuerus, the king of Assyria, reigned from India unto Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces all right so as we go on down in this uh text it says that the 10 tribes of israel after they were left to follow the dictate of their own mind and during the commotion and destructive warfare which uh, ensued to escape other extermination migrated according to the usage of the times in vast numbers into various countries but principally in northern africa as it then presented the safest and easiest route all right, so it's 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 given, uh, you know, the same thing that the prophecy said would happen. For the most part, they went into North Africa, but then something happened, and later on in this text it says, "But when uh, Mohammedanism overspread Northern Africa, destroying by fire and sword all of those of another religion, the Israelites descendants or the inhabitants occupying the central portion of Africa passed forward, seeking shelter to the south and west." So we further migrated to the south and west as the, the Muslim faith took over and persecution increased, uh, it forced forced uh, the 10 tribes south and west on the continent of Africa. So this is why when we get back in scripture and, and, the, and the prophecy state that when the Messiah comes, he's going to gather up those tribes from beyond the rivers uh, of Ethiopia. So all these things, you know, we just keep collecting data. It's going to start making more and more sense as we go along. All right. After the feast, the former and the latter reigns. All right. So we've talked about the feast. We talked about the Feast of Tabernacles last week. Uh, you know, we got the spring feast, Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. We had the summer feast, Pentecost, fall feasts, uh, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. And we just finished talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. So what happens then after the Feast of Tabernacles? So we'll get into that. And this is where the former and the latter reigns uh, come in. So in Exodus, when we were given the commandments about the feast days and to celebrate them, you know, the Most High says something very important and is alluding 
it's to something prophetically and, and you know, I'm hoping we catch this. So we're talking about harvest and we're talking about all these things, but we're talking about something else at the same time. So in Exodus, he said, three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt keep unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Abib. For in it thou camest out from Egypt and none shall appear before me empty. All right, that's key. He said, when you come back to me during these feast days, don't come back empty. And this is where the former and the latter rains uh, come in. So after the Feast of Tabernacles, which uh, lasted, uh, you know, it was eight days. We had a Sabbath, then we we, we had uh, six days, uh, you know, of, of just pure celebration. And then on that uh, eighth day, uh, we, we was a Sabbath. All right. So after that or during that time, we prayed for rains, you know, because the rains that we needed in order to, com uh, you know, complete the harvest for the next year had to occur uh, in that next month, if if the rains didn't come, that meant that that the harvest uh, for the next year wouldn't come up. And so we were dependent solely upon Yah to provide the rains so that we could perform the tasks that we needed to perform, uh, you know, as far as the harvest are concerned. And in order for us to have something to bring back to him, it started with him. It started with how we acknowledged him. All right, so the former rain, uh, Joel mentions the blessing of the autumn or the former rains, also known as the early rains. These rains would usually fall in late October and extend into the winter months in, in Israel. The autumn rains were important for preparing the ground for plowing and planting season, as well as to fill up the cisterns and wells that were, uh, would run dry during the summer heat. So this is important. So when we talk about the former rains, we're talking about the fall rains. All right. Uh, it also comes from the Hebrew word, uh, which implies teaching or teacher from Moray, uh, the autumn of the former rains. Then we talk about the latter rains. I'm sure you read that this in some of the prophets. Uh, the latter or spring rains, on, on the other hand, would fall in early April and were essential for the final ripening of the crop, as well as to prepare the ground for harvest. All right, so no rain would fall in the summer months. You know, estimated be, be between May to September, we wouldn't get any rain. And so in between those months, uh, the morning dew was dependent upon to water things because we didn't get the rainfall. So when you read scriptures and you hear the, uh, you know, the scriptures pointing to the dew on the ground and all these type things, is pointing to uh, the watering between uh, this period of time. So it's just, just a little extra something to look at. The former and the latter rain. All right, so where have we been up until this point? So leading up into the fall feast, we had the month of Elul. It was a period of reflection. It was a period of repentance. And we had to do it then because the previous year, the high priest had went into the tabernacle. He had been approved and our sins had been forgiven for a whole nother year. So it's just wise to, you know, to, to reflect, to look at ourselves, to say, okay, what is it that, you know, I need to get, you know, get rid of? What is it that I need to confess? What is it that, uh, you know, I need to put under subjection? And, and this whole month was a period of reflection and repentance because we had opportunity at that time to repent because we were still under the previous year's um a priest um forgiveness we could we could go for forgiveness anytime during that year for the things that we had done all right so the month of tishri would roll in and this the first day of the month of tishri we would have the awakening blast that was the feast of trumpets then we had 10 days after that leading up to the day of atonement all right. So the day of atonement would determine whether our sins will be forgiven for that next year. So the high priest will perform his duties and, you know, and is, you know, if he ex he's accepted before the most high, our sins are forgiven for another year. Then we would celebrate during the Feast of Tabernacles and we would pray for rain. So where do we go from here? So the next step was, you know, making sure that we gave the proper acknowledgement to the Most High for what he's doing, because everything, even he, he forgave our sins, but how we responded to that would determine whether the rains were coming or not. 
So the question would be, how do we respond to the grace now that has been given to us? If we want to look at the, uh, you know, from a spiritual perspective, he's gone into the heavenly tabernacle. He's sprinkled his blood. He's done all these things. How do I respond to what he's done? And this is, this is where this is going. So, you know, without the rain, we couldn't plow. All right. So the plowing is done after the early rains have softened the earth. All right. These rains usually came a few weeks after the Feast of Tabernacles. If not, the farmer uh, waited for, for them before plowing the ground. So if it didn't come, uh, you know, when we expected it, he had to wait because the ground would be too hard for him to go out and pl uh, plow. It, it was it, you just had to have the rain to go out and plow. And so the lack of rain uh, pointed to disfavor. Somehow we were not giving uh, the most high his due, you know, because all of our walk would depend upon the grace and the mercy of the most high. So Jeremiah alludes to this in 14 and 4, he said, because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. And the reason they were ashamed was because the rain didn't come in its season like it was supposed to, which meant it pointed to some type of disobedience uh, or, or dishonor to the most high on our behalf. And the rains didn't come when they were supposed to. And so it said the ground was dry. Uh, you know, the plowmen were ashamed and they covered their, their heads. Now, once the rain came, the industrious farmer would start his plow. But in Proverbs 24, it talks about the sluggard or the lazy plowman. He said the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore, shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. All right. So it's pointing to what the commandment was not to come before him um, empty. All right. So he's saying the sluggard, because, you know, in the October area, November area, uh, when the rain was coming in, it's time to uh, go out and plow and, and, and get the seeds planted. Uh, it was it could get cold. And so if if a lazy uh, plowman wouldn't go out during the winter or fall when it's when it's cold in winter months to plow you know this you know to plow because it was uncomfortable and it said because he wouldn't go out in the uncomfortable times to do what he was supposed to do when harvest time came he was going to be a beggar because he didn't do what he was supposed to do and he had nothing during the harvest time he's talking to us in the natural and he's talking to us spiritually because we have an opportunity now to to plow and to sow. And he said, so you won't come before me. When when the harvest time come, when the true harvest come, you won't have to come to me uh, empty. And so when we study parables, you see this all the time in the parables, how he gave one five, one two, one one, and one somebody comes back as a slugger, somebody who didn't do the thing that he was supposed to do in his season. Uh, because it was uncomfortable. And then when he stands before uh, the Messiah, he has nothing. And so, you know, this is this is what this is pointing to. He's talking to us about these things in the harvest. So these former and the latter rain. So the rain had to come. He had to grace us with his rain so that the ground could be ready so we could go out and plow and make sure that the seeds were planted. But if we didn't like the elements that were associated with the plowing, then we would harvest nothing. All right. So a good farmer would make sure that his plow was in good shape and ready for action. Uh, he would cut a new goad to use in prodding his team of oxen. He would make sure his yoke was smooth and fits the necks of the animals. And Yeshua spoke of the easy yoke promised to his obedience follows all right so let's look at this this plow uh that he's talking about so you see here uh th this plow that he has on the ground has this uh this hook these hooks under there so when it goes into the ground it it ruffles up the earth and the only way it can do that is if the ground is moist or wet so he had to wait on the rain and then you see on this bottom picture here, we see the oxen with a yoke on their neck. And then we see this stick going back from uh, the middle of the yoke all the way back to where the plow is. 
And you know, when you when you really look at this, it forms a cross. You know, so it's it's you know it, it's alluding to what Yeshua was telling us. You know, I've I'm the I've been the the you know put on the yoke already. I plowed the field. I'm giving you good seed. Then he says, pick up your cross and follow me. So he's he's he, and then he said, yoke yourself. And so when you look at the at the yoke itself, it's in the form of a cross. So you have all this imagery here in the harvest and the plowing and the yoke and all these things pointing to the work that the Messiah has done and then him telling us to do what I did. All right. So uh, the writers, a uh, biblical writers would often mention Aaron a plowshares. And these plows could without, uh, would, could without much work be changed in the swords for warfare. Thus the prophet Joel said, beat your plowshares in the sword. All right, so we, we see that. We see these, this, this part of the plow that they would take a take off and it would be metal and they could beat those into swords and instead of plowing the field when it was time for warfare, they would use these for, to go into war. And so the same idea is there. When you beat your uh, plowshares and the swords, just like the Most High watered the field for you to be able to plow, he'll also be with you in the time of war to help you fight the battle. So all this imagery is there about us depending upon the Messiah. So he also says that when he comes back and he judges among the nations, Isaiah 2 and 4, that he's going to do the reverse. He's going to have uh, us beat the swords back into the plowshare because there's going to be peace. Not going to be any war, so he he goes in the opposite direction there, and so then you have the yoke. The yoke is a, a stick that fits the neck of the cow, you know. We and you know that's this is the part that goes around their neck, and then it, you know, with the stick in the middle, it looks like uh, a cross. And then there's this goad uh, that that's talked about. The goad was carried by the plowman. There's a wooden rod, sharp uh, point at one end. So with this, the farmer would hurry up his slow-moving animals. The conviction of sin that came to Saul of Tarsus and led to his conversion was compared to the to the pricks of an ox goat. In other words, this goat here is referenced when uh, Saul uh, or Paul was on the road uh, to, to Damascus and he was confronted by Yeshua. And he asked him, uh, you know, you know, why are you going in the direction you're going? And he said, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? He was talking about the goat. He was saying, I'm pointing you in one direction, but you're going in another direction. And it's, it's hard for you to do this, kick it against the pricks. And so we know what all, what happened to us all. Uh, you know, he, he turned in the right direction and he began to do, uh, you know, go out in the harvest and do the things that the Most High wanted him to do. So this is the goat. So in one hand you have the goat, in the other hand you have the uh, the plow. So you'd be plowing with one hand, and you have the goat in the other hand. So plowing the plowman held the one handle of the plow with one of his hands while he carries the goat in the other hand. Yeshua said, "No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of Elohim." So it was a fatal uh, mistake for the farmer to look back because his implement is so light that the worker often has to press down with all his weight up on it to keep it from leaving the furrow. In other words, this plow that he had in the ground ruffling up the soil so that the seeds could go in. If he looked back, it would lift that up and the work that he was doing out in the field was unprofitable because the seeds wouldn't go into the ground because the ground would not be ruffled up. And so this is what Yeshua was referring to. He said, if you do that, if you keep looking back after things that don't matter while you're out here working the field, he said, if you do that in the kingdom, you're not fit for the kingdom. All right. And then there was another uh, instrument called the pickaxe or the mattock. And where the ground was hard or there was a rocky hillside, uh, it's not possible to use the plow. So in these places, if, if the peasant farmer is industrious, he will prepare the soil by using the pickaxe or the mattock. He would still have to wait on the same rains to come, but he would use the pickaxe or the mattock in order to dig up all the rocks and all this type of stuff that, that would be on the hillside. And so Isaiah speaks of hills that shall be digged with the mattock. 
and by using and implement all the available ground is utilized uh, for the crop. This is alluding to some of the parables that we talked about when we talk about some of the uh, seeds uh, falling on, uh, you know, on, by the wayside, some falling on stony ground. It's, it's pointing to that, you know, the reason the ground was, wasn't ready was because we didn't have a, a good plowman uh, to go out there and, and prepare the soil for it. All right. So, you know, we'll, we'll get ready to close this out, but, I, you know, I, I wanted to go over these things and talk about the plow and the yoke and the gold and, and, and the form and the ladder reins because it was necessary that the former that the former rains came in the fall so that we could plow. And then it was necessary that the latter rains came in the spring so that the crops could mature. And when the crops matured, then they were ready for the harvest. It's pointing to spiritual uh, principles. All right. Now, Yeshua came first. He was he, he came first. He he was uh, the one that he was the good farmer. He was the plow. He was a bullock. He suffered uh, the the cross. You know, he he wore that yoke. Uh, you know, he was prodded by the ho Holy Rook. He followed the guidance of the Holy Rook. He all of these things are pointing to his work, and he did all of these things so that we could come along and we could pick up our cross. He said, "Our, uh, you know, uh, put our yoke on." that resembles the cross and follow after the methodology of himself. That's what he's pointing to. So we read these scriptures about the harvest. And he talks about the former and the latter rains. He's talking about himself in the former and latter rains. And, and I'm telling you, when you read the prophets and you pick up on all of this agricultural terminology, it's going to blow your mind once it's open up to you, what he's really saying to us. So then we get back to um, scriptures like Matthew 13. And Yeshua is talking to the multitude in parables. And he said, without a parable spoke he, uh, you know, none, none unto them, not unto them. So he wouldn't speak unto the people without a parable because when speaking in parables, only those with, with the spiritual eye can really and spiritual ear can hear what he's saying. It's going to be madness to anybody else. He said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will other things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So he's revealing through parables his secrets. Can you see his secret? Can you hear what he's saying? It said, then Yeshua sent the multitude away and went to the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. He said, that's me. I'm the one who is sowing the good seed in this parable. He said, the field is the world. So when we go back to, you know, Old Testament scriptures and the prophets and they start talking about the field, they're talking about the world. Then he said the good seed, because there's two seeds out there. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked ones. So there's two seeds being planted, you know, and he's planting the good seed and the enemy is planting the bad seed. He said the enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest, now we're talking about the harvest, when we're talking about bringing in everything and not coming in empty. The harvest, he said, is the end of the age. or the end. Of, it, it says world here, but it, it really means age, the end of the age. And he said the reapers are the angels. All right. And he said, therefore, the tares are gathered and burning the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world or age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. <clears throat> there shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth at the Son in the kingdom of their Father, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's using agricultural terms, things that our people would have known uh, as far as you know, with, with a with a spiritual, um, with the spirit, would be able to then translate those things into the plan that the Most High has for us. 
So it's important for us when we go back, I want to throw this in there. I know this is not exciting for a lot of people, but it's still important for your understanding. When you go back into the Old Testament scriptures and you and you start and, and Paul himself uses words that are agricultural in nature, but he's pointing to something greater. And it's important for 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 serious students to start looking at the um terminology that he's using because he's telling us when we go back and study the harvest and we study the feast days and all these things he's pointing to something else but the you know but to use the picture or the shadow so that we can see what the reality of things really really are all right so um i hope that makes sense um you know especially like seeing that yoke as a form of a, a of the cross and that, you know, when we look at the formula of rains, nothing that we do in the kingdom can be done without the grace and mercy of the Most High. Unless he gives us his formula and his ladder rains, we can do nothing. And that's the attitude that we should have when we go out and do our work for him that is still him working through us. It's not, it's not us doing these things on our own. And so once we line up with him and agree with him and we go out and do the things that we're supposed to do uh, in the right spirit, uh, you know, then we're going to be fruitful in the kingdom. And he says, when, it, when harvest times come, because we've stored our treasures up in the heaven, then we won't come before him empty. And so if you get anything out of this, that would be what I would want you to get. The two things that anything that you do on his behalf by his grace and his mercy. And number two, don't come before him empty just because it might be cold out there when you got to go out and plow just because it might be uncomfortable when you go out and plow just because, it's, you know, you, you, you feel like the season is a little too chilly for you to go out and plow, you know, put the work in anyway and do what he, he wants you to do. All right, Mr. Daniels. So as you were talking, I uh, looked up the word or the definition for tear, and it's uh, from an old Arabic word mean, meaning tarha or meaning that which is removed. And I never understood. I always thought like, you know, you've got the chaff, the wheat and the chaff when they shake things and that could be considered a tear. So the visual makes a lot of sense. You know, a deduction from the gross weight of a substance is the other uh, thing. So when you think of those who will be saved, those who will not be saved, it's the deduction of the gross uh, of, you know, I guess the entire humanity that's ever, ever lived. So um, that was pretty interesting. The other thing that I was thinking about, um, and I'd never heard it uh, told, said, or even explained that, you know, Christ came until uh, the lesson that you did where Christ came on the back of an ass and um, the the hair on the back is designed in the form of a cross. So it's kind of symbolic of him, you know, being on the cross before physically being on the cross. And then here now hearing that the, the yoke is in the form of a cross as well. And the visual that came to my mind um, when it says, take up my yoke for is as easy. It, it, in my mind, always hearing that scripture is like, okay, well, how is it that a yoke, something being on your shoulders, on your neck as you're pulling and plowing, how does that translate to being easy? But then what came into my mind was, uh, you know, Paul's apocalypse where he's describing all the things that happen to those people who end up in uh, Tartarus or the different levels. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, yeah, I would rather take the yoke now because that's light and momentary. That's easy. I can deal with that now because I definitely don't want to be in a perpetual state of, you know, uh, punishment or whatever. So that's what came to my mind as you were reading that part of the scripture. That's the, the thing that jumped into my head. Yeah. And I, I mean, wanted to share that. Yeah. And, you know, that's good. And, you know, when we talk about the, the yoke, you know, um, you know, the plowman would make sure that the that the yoke was smooth, that it didn't have splinters in it, or that it didn't have anything uncomfortable around the neck. So when you went out and done your work, the field, because he's a good he's a good plowman, he's a great farmer, you know, our Messiah. The field is 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 wet and ready, and and so when we plow, you know, it's not going to be a struggle to pull 
uh, uh, the plow. But then when you contrast that to uh, to the curses that he put up on us, and he talks about the enemy, what the enemy was going to do to us. He said he's going to put iron yokes up, up on our necks. You get the uncomfortable, heavy iron yokes that he was going to put up on our necks. And so as a people, we should have a contrast or a comparison between the yoke that Christ puts on us and the yoke that our enemy has put on us for the last 3,500 years. We, we, of all people in the world, we should be able to compare the yokes. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's important to uh, to talk about the, the, the yoke, the different uh, between the yoke that Yeshua asked us to put on and the yoke that the enemy has put on us for the last 3,500 years. All right, anybody else? All right, good deal. Um, let's keep um, Corey uh, lifted up. I sent you, you guys an email out about that, you know. So we're definitely going to keep him lifted up, you know, as he... Uh, continue to get uh, tests run and, 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 and to set the treatments up. We'll continue to keep uh, James and Julie lifted up. Uh, my cousin James, and, uh, he had a, a had a stroke a few days ago, so he's he's doing better, but keep him, him lifted up. And then uh, Chanel's mom was in the hospital, so keep her lifted up. And a young lady named um, uh, Kimora, I won't go into any detail, but keep just remember her name and lift her name up before uh, the most high. All right. Okay. Uh, Hank, you got, you got some. Yeah. Um, if you add to that prayer list, my, my wife's aunt, um, she's in the hospital um, dealing with uh, pneumonia. So if you okay. all, if y'all remember her as well, I okay. appreciate that. We would appreciate it. D did I hear you earlier say that the, the plowing, would take place after the Feast of Tabernacles? Yes, it was uh, probably a few weeks after when the rains came. So after the Feast of Tabernacles, during the Feast of Tabernacles, we were prayed for the rain. We were we were favored at that time. The high priest has done what he's supposed to do. We're in celebration. So we're praying then for the next step. We're praying for the rains to come, which would come in the next month. And uh, yeah, it was around October area, October, November. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, the, way that I, the way that I'm thinking about this, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, it, it points to the return of Yeshua, right? Mm -hmm. So what what is this you know, what is this plowing after the Feast of Tabernacles pointing to prophetically? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> All right. So remember that these feast days are layered. That's number one. They're layered. So they can mean several different things at the same time. All right. So the Feast of Tabernacles was supposed to happen in the first month, which was Tishri, right? And because of our rebellion, he changed the first month to the seventh. All right. Now, that's for Israel. But for the rest of the world, it was still the first month, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. Yeshua comes on the scene, and you see him working. He's plowing the field. I mean, he's getting ready to plow the field. So what happened first with him still happened first before any of the other harvest takes place. It's only backwards when it comes to us because we, because we should have been, we should have been first, but we end up being last. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So the, the ideal way that it was supposed to happen was he would come on the scene as our you know, king or whatever, and you know, he or you know, our lamb, our bullock, and all those things. He would make the sacrifices. We would accept him as the high priest and what he's done and the king. And we would go in this celebration. And as being the nation that's the light of the world, we would then go out and we would we would we would wait for the rains to come and we would go out and we would plow the fields. Because <laughs> we're the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And we would spread this great news of our Messiah to the whole world. And then by the time Passover gets here, the, the harvest is coming up, you know, and, and then, you know, 50 days after that, the next harvest is coming up. And we're just bringing all these great nations and peoples, strangers, poor, all into the kingdom. You with me? Mm -hmm. And then by that next 
by that next uh, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, then we had the coronation of the king and all these things because now all the nations are up under him because we've gone out obediently and we've done the things we were supposed to do by plowing the field and all this type of thing. Right. That's the way it was supposed to, you know, in theory, occur. But he comes on the scene, we reject him. And he said, well, what was supposed to be first is going to end up being last. Right. And what was supposed to be last is going to end up being first. So we see the poor and the strangers and all this, which would come in during the Passover and all these things. We see them now going in before the nation of Israel. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So th they mean the same thing, but we had to think of it in context of you know, he was still doing the work. It's just that we rejected the work. So that, that puts... Um... <clears throat> That kind of puts um, Romans 11, it kind of shines a, a, a light on it for me anyway, because it talks about all Israel being saved. And then there's this, this uh, just around verse number 33, it breaks out into this hymn of praise. And then it gets down to the very bottom. It says at the very bottom of uh, Romans 11, it says, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. And so, you know, I really, I really appreciate you, you know, what you, you talked about earlier about how we have to appreciate that everything that we give back to him comes from him. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have to remember <laughs> that, you know, in the context of Yeshua coming back, you know, in terms of our salvation, we have to remember all this, uh, you know, and I really appreciate how you kind of articulated that as you went through. Yeah, it, it's important, man. I mean, it's, it's powerful. It, it plays into even the attitude that we're supposed to have with tithing, and all that type stuff. Yeah. Because what we're giving back is what was all is 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 because of what was already given. And so the giving back to him, even in tithe form, you know, and and then then the the, the second thing about the the tithe portion is that it has to come after the harvest. Right. So it's it, 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 that makes sense. So it, it you you do all of these you do all these things with the right spirit. You have a harvest that's ready. Uh, you know, and 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 we we attribute what we've acquired in the kingdom to the one who gave us the things to. And you to you do it. a lot of doctrine right now. You get what we, <laughs> we, 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 so we're attributing all the gain, all the things to his grace and his mercy. That's why a tithe is a tenth because it's saying somebody kept the law. I'm taking the fact that somebody kept the law and I'm presenting to you a tenth because I'm saying what I was able to do was because somebody kept the law. Right. And the one who kept the law wasn't me. But I'm giving you a, a tense, which is, is pointing to the law, to show you that I understand that it wasn't me, that it was the one who kept it, the reason I'm able to give or do what it, you know. The nine tenths that I have is because somebody kept the law. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, you, you can bet your bottom dollar this this lesson ain't going viral just because of what you just <laughs> said. And that's the thing. <laughs> I ain't in it for the viral. And I know what you're saying. I'm, I just want, I understand by scripture that the truth is not going to be popular. There you go. So th th that's not my motivation. My motivation is to reach as many as we can reach uh, with the spiritual aspects. You know, th those who want to go into the narrow gates. And everybody don't want to do that. I want to try to get in that narrow. I want to try to get in the narrow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. All right. Good question. All right. Well, if there's nobody else, just remember to keep uh, everybody uh, lifted up in prayer. And we'll call it a day. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to come uh, before you and, and, and discuss the concepts that you have so graciously uh, given to us, knowing that it wasn't because we were so good and we were so kind that you did it. It's because of your grace and your mercy that you chose us to receive what we're receiving in the time that we're receiving. 
And Father, because you've done that, Father, we ask you, uh, Father, to continue, Father, to sh shower that grace and mercy upon us, continue to open up our hearts, continue to open up our minds, so you get all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We just want to thank you. Father, we ask you to keep, uh, you know, uh, Corey lifted up, touch him in his body, and Father, to do those things that we know you're able to do, heal him, uh, you know, as as you see fit, Father. We know that you are powerful. We know that you're able to do it. We know you're able to do it for Corey. We know you're able to do it for, for, for Julie. And Father, we ask you for my cousin James to do it for him as well. Father, we ask you to go into the hospital and touch your nails, Mom. And we ask you to reside with the young lady named Kamora. We ask you to be with those who have recently lost loved ones, you know, particularly with we, we know that Vera lost her sisters and others have lost, uh, you know, people in their family as well. We ask you to be with them and continue to give them comfort because a few weeks of losing someone as close to us is just not enough time to get over the grief. And we just ask you to be with them and comfort them. We ask you, Father, to anoint our heads from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Help us to keep our minds and hearts stayed on you. And you said, if we keep our uh, eyes stayed on you, then you'll keep us in perfect peace. We just want to thank you for all your promises in your son, Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Shalom, everybody. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. 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 In a shocking 1700s historical document of black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes also known as black Jews were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option 1. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option 2. Get an easy to read edited ebook, plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of $10. Option 3. Get an audiobook for easy listening, plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of $15. Learn the real history they don't want you to know.